is going to be giving the first part. Uh, Howard is a uh, was a startup engineer at Vermont Yankee and in a pump storage site. Uh, site. He was a uh, officer on a submarine, and he was um, <clears throat> he has an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and a graduate degree in nuclear engineering, and he's very very knowledgeable about the grid and uh, the physical grid, which I'm not as knowledgeable about. So. I'll take you away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. It's good to have you here. Thank you all for coming here. Good morning. Uh, I have a perfect, you gave me a perfect lead in for some up to date things. I went online this morning and looked, and there was an article in one of the electric industry trade sheets uh, saying that Energy Secretary Perry is concerned about the grid collapsing. He says he's got a proposal out there to subsidize nuclear and coal plants to keep the grid from collapsing. Not because they're nuclear and coal, but because they're the type of generation. Uh, and that ties in with how the grid works physically. And as far as the regulation goes, Meredith asked me to go to uh, Irving Energy Institute presentation a couple weeks ago, where Don Kreese, who's the consumer advocate in New Hampshire, was talking about electric, um, electric grid and regulation and so forth. And uh, he very nicely said, when asked about regulation, he says, oh, it's a Rube Goldberg. <laughs> you know? So that's what our consumer advocate thinks is tied in, into the government. And when I ask him the question, well, in the old days when utilities owned the plants, owned the wires, and had a responsibility not only to serve everybody, but to serve reliably, have regulated rates. But they also had the responsibility to plan ahead and make sure there was sufficient resources, generation and transmission and so forth, for the future. And I said, who has that responsibility now? And he says, well, you know, that's a good question. <laughs> and he's our consumer advocate, and he's not clear on that. And as Mary has so well pointed out, because of the politics. So. I'm concerned about that, as we all are. I'm staying away from that today. We're going to talk about how it actually physically works so that when some of these issues and policies come up, you may be able to filter out what's real and what's not doable or what's too expensive. Quick review of terms. And by the way, if there's any questions, uh, please ask them as we go along. Willem's going to write them down so we can get them correct and get the answers correct. Uh, Thank you. Um, electricity is what? Comes from electrons around atoms. And the charge they have provides the potential for voltage. When they're flowing, that's current. When they're doing something right now, that's power. When they're have done something or when they're waiting to do something, that's potential energy. In English measurements, I'll use an example. If we had a 55 pound weight on the floor with some pulleys and raised it up 10 feet, that would be 550 foot pounds of energy. If we let that fall and it ran something in one second, that would be 55 foot pounds per second which is exactly one horsepower of energy and three quarters of a kilowatt when you shift to metric. Energy is when you're doing it. Energy is when it's stored or it has done something which you're paying for on your bill. You don't pay for power, you pay for energy. Power is what it's doing right now. These terms are not often used, are often not used carefully in the media. They mix power and energy and so forth. AC is electric current flowing back and forth, DC flowing continuously in one direction, creating, of course, the ways we all do it, many ways, transforming an electric power means changing the voltage from high to low, low to high, for efficiency of transmission or safety, depending. One of the safety ones we all have in our house, a little tiny transformer somewhere, it steps down the house voltage to about 12 volts, I think, for your doorbell. 
because they have 120 volts outside when somebody's standing there with wet feet and there's a malfunctioning doorbell could be not good. <clears throat> Using is, we have many, many uses for electricity and it has displaced so much human labor and one of its chief features is that there's no waste at the point of use, like gas or anything else, candles, whatever. Switches are devices which open and close circuits normally. If there's a fault, short circuit, overload, and there might be damage, if you open a switch, it'll damage the switch. A circuit breaker is designed to automatically open and be used again. And these same things occur throughout the transmission system. Switch yards, as you'll see a picture of, have both switches and circuit breakers. Any questions on that? Switch and circuit breaker? Okay. For a reality, I thought I would include, with Merritt's approval, of course, this flow chart of energy in the U.S. done by Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California, which was an outgrowth of the uh, Manhattan Project and still continues as a, doing many scientific things for the government, as do the other laboratories that were formed for the Manhattan Project, as you probably know. Uh, they've been doing these since the early 70s. And it's very useful for me, and I think would be for you too. It shows all the different kinds of energy. Does this help people? Yes. Go ahead. And okay, yeah. it's, it's got a flow from left to right, which is the way we're used to reading, color-coded for the different types of energy. And the sizes are roughly proportional to the amount of energy involved. Okay. The units are in quads, which is quadrillion BTUs, but, which are heat units, but they can be converted to electricity or horsepower or whatever you want. Uh, it's the relative amounts which are important. And there are numbers throughout, so you can quickly see what the relative uh, parts are. So <coughs> this was 19, uh, 2017 for the entire country. They also do them for the states, but not every year. You can look them up online again the way I did yesterday. And the last ones for the states were in 2014. So they'll probably be doing them again soon, I would guess. Uh, I would imagine the reason they don't do them every year is because of the expense. Gathering all the data. Power? Yes. Can you explain rejected energy? Yes, of course. This is that. That is what's wasted, and that's very important in the discussion. Uh, for instance, in electricity generation where you're using a heat engine cycle, whether it's a steam turbine or a diesel engine or something else, or your car or your lawnmower, limited by the second law of thermodynamics, you can only get so much efficiency depending on the high temperature you can achieve. So you wind up with about two-thirds you look at the numbers, 31.1, 66.7 total, two-thirds goes to waste. And that what winds up in the environment. Can I make yes. a comment on that? I just wanted to, to say that um, uh, this is the ultimate heat engine equation, and it's pretty simple. So the high temperature... These are all in, in these temperatures are all in um, Kelvin or something that were absolute geez, temperature. Absolute temperature where, where zero isn't. There's a frost tonight. Zero is absolute zero. Okay, so T two minus T one over T two is efficiency. The hot temperature minus the cold temperature of the cycle over the hot temperature is the efficiency. And in general, uh, this this adds up to being. Um, uh, about 33% is the efficiency for most most uh, heat engines. Uh, some are higher, some are lower. Now, what's the only way to make it higher? Remember that T1, the low temperature of the cycle, is generally controlled by the atmosphere. In other words, you can't, you don't put a refrigerator at the end of the cycle. It's it's the ambient usually, or or, or higher than that. So T2 minus T1. The, the only way to, to raise the efficiency is to raise T2. 
for the hot part of the cycle. But you get to a point where you're going to melt your um, you're going to melt your, uh, your 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 container for the cycle. So basically, for most processes, uh, most of the energy is two thirds of the energy is rejected because you can't get T2 high enough. Yeah, um, we can't see anything back here besides color. Could you tell us just read down what those are and tell us what oh, the basic sure. concept yeah. of the sure. Uh, it, starting at the bottom, the biggest, this is petroleum, biomass, coal, natural gas, geothermal, wind, hydro, nuclear, and solar. Total for the country, 2017. As you, as you go to the right, what happens? Well, this is, this is where they all go to. And this is the amounts that go to the different places. And this is where it comes out at the end for the uses, residential, commercial, industrial transportation, and then that combines into all the energy services uh, are getting produced. Okay, thank you. And then the rest is rejected energy. So right, right here at the end, you see the two to one. Yep. Okay, thank you. Difference. Okay, you can look up these online. And also, I will be putting the. Uh, the uh, slides onto the, the Google Drive okay. after afterwards. Yeah. Okay. But in spite of all the rhetoric, here's solar up here, pretty tiny amount. Uh, what doesn't show in solar is the amount that is so-called behind the meter. That would be, for instance, somebody's house that had solar panels and batteries and your house connected. <coughs> solar, the sun is shining. They're making electricity, they're using it in the house, and they're selling some to the power company, too. The power company can see what you're selling to them, but they can't see how much the solar panels are making. So that's not there. Uh, or nor can they see, yes. That's as it was in 2017, but that doesn't mean that how, that's how it has to be. Oh, <laughs> yes, absolutely correct. You know, and of course, we all know there's a lot of development going on, but that is the reality. That was at the end of 2017, yeah. and enthusiastic uh, proponents sometimes make it sound like all of it is just around the corner, solar and wind, but uh, this is the reality at the end of 2017. Okay, wind is uh, right here. That's 2.25 compared to 36.2, 4.9, 14.4 for coal, and 20.0 for natural gas. Long way to go for wind and solar. And solar is 0.775. That's a reality of where we are. That's why we have this. 775 out of 97.7. Yeah. Right out of the Yeah, yeah. Is this cumulative or is this at a point in time? This is for one year. This is for one year. For all energy use for the year came out to these quantities. We'll get a lot more point in time stuff when I'm I'm talking because uh, it, so, it, the, each, the fact that each, demand varies is an important part of how policy is set. Yeah. Well, I said ten to the fifteenth BTUs can convert. It's a lot large, large amount of energy. What's important for us is the relative amount right now. Um, as Meredith, I've got to t tell you, this is invented by that Frenchman Carnot, right? Yes. And Meredith's company is named? Carnot, Carnot Commun Communication. Carnot <laughs> Communications. <laughs> and when I little... show it to a, an engineer, there's a little smile. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. The rest of us. Uh, no, but, the, but then, then I once right. talked to a, my... Uh, one of the people in my uh, synagogue said, well, Carnal Communications? That's <laughs> 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 yeah. anyway, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the grid is a system to supply electric power and it's grown up all the time to meet varying demands. Originally one way, now moving to two way to do it safely, reliably, to survive and recover from disruptive events to do it economically and with minimum environmental impact. It's a 
system of power generation and supply to end users, and now also a purchaser from endpoint generators. Uh, using generators of various kinds, there's tiny amounts of storage in pump storage and some batteries. Uh, <coughs> Wires, switches, instruments, internal communications, protective devices, a big machine. Grids we know. Your house is actually a grid. And if you've got solar panels and batteries, you've got some storage. Cars are a grid, too. Internal combustion engine cars with a battery for starting have an electrical system that uh, also uh, runs the car. And if something happens to the generator, the alternator, uh, this has happened to me when the belt broke. Get a red light on the dashboard and the power steering was harder in that kind of car. Keep right on going. Because the battery instantly picks up the current. And that's what's important for the grid, being able to instantly pick up the current. Same thing happens in the, the nuclear submarines I was on. They were both AC and DC. The DC battery was primarily for use when, the react when you're submerged in a reactor, has to shut down, uh, or you choose to shut it down, uh, the DC picks up instantly. And then you can turn around and charge the battery. Those are grids we know. Uh, the grid covers the entire country and beyond, and with tiny amount of storage and batteries. Pump storage is, as gentlemen said, a battery, but if the machines are running, it can pick up the load instantly. If not, they have to start up. Yes? What's pumped storage mean? Thank you for asking. Uh, it's a hydroelectric system that pumps water uphill when there's excess electricity at a low price and generates electricity when the water runs down and to make electricity at uh, a higher price. And uh, from my experience at the Ludding plant, Ludington plant, uh, the turnaround is three for four. For every four units of energy you put in, you get three back. But you're getting it back at a time during the day when you need it, and the price is higher. So the differential in price pays for it. And we'll see a big picture of that later. Uh, and there's a number of them around the country, but just as an aside, uh, they're limited in where you can put them uh, because of the environmental impact uh, on all that water flowing around. And as we pointed out for North, Northfield Mountain, and you may have seen it uh, in the paper uh, up here, for Northfield Mountain, which is along the Connecticut River, south of uh, the New Hampshire border, New Hampshire-Vermont border in Massachusetts, uh, running on the Connecticut River. Uh, it's having a big environmental impact on the river. And that was not considered because in the days when it was built, back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, uh, it wasn't considered. But it's been found that the outrush of water into the river and then sucking water back up has had a disruptive effect on the fish life. And there's probably ways to fix that by putting a bypass alongside the river for the fish to go up. Uh, but that's an example of the development of the grid. Okay, just uh, to give some background on that, um, 18, um, 1882, Thomas Edison built the first grid in Manhattan. It was DC, and it distributed for lighting in lower Manhattan. Uh, 1886, Westinghouse engineer who had, was from there went to Great Barrington, Massachusetts and built a little grid to supply some lighting and businesses in the town using transformers, which Westinghouse had invented. So you could transmit at a high voltage and then use more safely at a lower voltage. 1896 is when the Niagara Falls station with 10 5,000 horsepower generators went into operation. So over the succeeding time, much more than 100 years, the grid has been developing. And it's interesting, uh, and there's always been, as now with computers and everything else, 
uh, entrepreneurs interested in doing good things for society and also making money. And uh, Thomas Edison said, uh, quote, uh, when he was setting up his grid in Manhattan, we will make electricity so cheap that only the rich will burn candles. <laughs> kind of reminds me of uh, too cheap to meter in the 1950s. Yeah, I yeah. Call it. Anyway. Okay. Okay, here's a map of one grid, mo uh, mostly not the highest voltages. Uh, from FEMA. You can look these up online. This is just to give you an idea of the extent of things and the way the grid is distributed. Obviously, the uh, <coughs> denser grids are where you have greater population and also greater industrial activity. Here's another one at higher voltages showing the different connection areas. Uh, and then this last uh, shows proposed DC links. Uh, DC transmission at high voltage with large quantities of electricity is more economical than AC because the AC line losses are higher. Due to the AC, it can act like an antenna and broadcast energy out. Uh, but the expense of the conversion equipment, changing AC to DC and then back to AC at the other end makes it economical only for large distances at large amounts of power. But that's why you have a DC Can lights. I ask you to go back to the other slide and just show how few DC connections there are now. See, this, this is the high voltage DC current now. And you can see one, two, three, four. And, and, and I just wanted to make sure that you understood the contrast between that and the next one, which is the proposed one. So there is an existing one in New Hampshire. Is that New Hampshire? Well, yeah, I guess is that's, a, that's, a, that's coming down from Hydro-Quebec and, yeah. and yeah, so forth. Yeah. 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 And there's a proposed one on the next page. The next page is the proposed one, so yeah. much more extensive. I just, I just wanted to show you the difference between one, two, three, I pointed them out, and the proposed ones. Yeah. Is the grid in Canada and Mexico totally distinct from the grid in the U.S., or are they interconnected? Here we go, no. The eastern interconnection where we in New England are part of is, as shown on this map, we are tied in with Canada, eastern Canada for the Eastern Interconnection. Down, when you get down to Texas, they're separate. And of course, Mexico, I don't know what the tie-in is with Mexico, tell me the truth. Our, the Canadian grid is our place with the U.S. grid, mm -hmm. purpose. Mm -hmm. So that's why any connection has to be DC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We could, well, yeah. please, can you repeat that, yeah. Roland, yeah. please? The uh, Canadian grid is out of phase with the U.S. grid. It has the same frequency, <coughs> but it's out of phase, and that's done on purpose. And so any tie-in has to be a DC line. So the DC, of course, has no frequencies, and because um, it's, it's the direct current, and it has a transform a, a AC to DC transform transformation station at each end to go from AC Canadian to AC US. And then the phase is eliminated when that is done, when that conversion takes place. So that's how the Canadian grid can be connected to the U.S. grid. It cannot be directly connected because they're out of phase on purpose. What's the purpose of that? Well, <laughs> it has to do with independence. The U.S. grid is so much larger it could overwhelm the Canadian grid or Mexican grid. I don't know if the Mexican grid is out of phase with the U.S. grid, but the uh, Canadian grid, the, the U.S. grid is at least ten times larger. So any excess exporting that the U.S. grid could do at times would overwhelm the U.S. The Canadian grid. So for protection, they had, are out of phase. Now this is not uncommon. It is commonly done in Europe. Those are called phase-changing transformers. Poland has them in place to uh, have Germany uh, 
prevent Germany from disturbing its grid with excess wind or solar electricity when it does occur. So they went in these transformers to basically stop that. The, the Dutch has a, these transformers in place as well. So countries that are not able to uh, handle these ins inflows, these sudden inflows of electricity from Germany, for example, which are large, those countries, they protect their own grids with that type of uh, the, the devices, phase changing transformers. Why don't uh, you get some more details on that and we can talk about it in the fourth session or when we're at ISO New England? How they do that and... Well, the, well, the connection between Canada and... and uh, there are a couple of connections between Canada and the, and the Canadian grid. The, the New England grid and the Canadian grid that are DC lines, and uh, and they're independent from the Canadian from the uh, New England grid. The line that that you just saw that Meredith showed, um, that's a DC line, and it only goes the electricity only goes through Vermont. It is not seen, you know, not monitored or seen by ISO and E. No, but it's not part of the New England grid. It's a separate line that operates on its own. And there is a wind turbine system in northern Maine that is not connected to the New England grid. It's connected to the Canadian grid because the New England grid doesn't reach that far north. So in order to connect the output of that wind turbine system to a grid, it had to connect to the Canadian grid. So that's, that's just a little curiosity. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Getting down into the weeds and the tails, but thanks, Will. As, as long as we're in we'll the talk weeds, some more about that in the fourth session. As long as we're in the weeds, I want to do a little circle here. This is the territory of ISO New England. Okay, hmm. just a little quick circle. Where, yeah, where, the blue where area. Is. The blue area. Yeah. Okay, sorry for yeah, the Yeah, but notice up here in Maine, right. the very eastern right. part, is actually part of New Brunswick. Yeah. As you connected, made, connected to the New Brunswick. Yeah, region. as you yeah. said, because there of is, the geography. Is, that's right. There is no connection between mm -hmm. the New England grid at that point. Yeah. Talking right. talking about wind, uh, yeah. you often hear, oh, yes, go ahead. Oh, oh, no, oh. I was scratching my head. Gee, <laughs> we, we started wind at Grandpa's Knob in Vermont. Why didn't we have that right away, you know? That was 1941, and it was for proof of principle. And it was, of course, during the war, and it broke down and was not fixed, and they didn't pick it up after the war. And at that time, they found out that, uh, or could calculate it, rather, based on the little bit of running it did, that uh, they could supply energy to the grid with wind, but it was going to be more expensive than the other. It still is, but uh, so it didn't go further. It was a very crude, it had a 60-cycle generator, and to make sure that it always generated 60 cycles, they had an operator up in the housing with the generator adjusting the angle of the blades. <laughs> so you would always get 60 cycles. So as they said, it's proof of principle. It proved you could do it, but there was a lot of development needed beyond that. <clears throat> Oops, sorry. And the thing up again, upside down again. Oh. The grid components, generators, 60 cycle, 50 cycle in Europe, all kinds of drivers, water, hydroelectric, gas, from pipelines, from cow power, from landfill, steam turbines, coal, oil, gas combined cycle, nuclear, biomass, diesel engines, non-synchronous varying speed, wind turbines, but the output has to be 60 cycles to match the grid, so it's converted uh, electronically, and variable, variable speed pump storage in some places in the world with uh, very high elevations. Uh, then you've got AC to DC AC, 
as we talked about for transmission and solar panels making DC, which gets converted right at the house to AC for use in the house and going on the grid. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you have the category of demand resources. Those are things that can be turned off. And if you need extra power on the grid, you can either supply some more generation or turn something off, just as you would in your house. And there are factories or even homes <coughs> where the grid can control that and shut off the factory when they need it or shut off the home uh, or some of the home. I just want to say that in general, the grid operator, the, this does get into a policy a little bit, that unless they're what they call shedding load, that is the grid is in trouble and they're turning things off, uh, if you are a factory and uh, you're willing to be shut off, uh, you get a deal on that. In other words, you're paid as a demand resource as if you had been a, a generator. Okay, so the demand resources bid in. Uh, big demand resources like a factory bid into the 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 auctions just as generators do. Moving, yeah, well, moving along from that, I just I just didn't want you to think that the the grid operator can shut off any factory anytime they want to. They can if the grid is in great trouble. But to balance it, the the factory has to say, yeah, I'm a demand resource. I'm I'm bidding into that program. Yeah, and that's a, a yeah. basic question. Use the term cycle. What do you mean by cycle? Means the 60 cycle. Well, the cycle is the change in the voltage, starting from zero, raises to a peak, falls down to zero, r raises up in the other direction, and goes back to zero because of the way the generator turns. And with alternating current, uh, it's efficient for generation and particularly for motors. Okay, you, because you don't have the problem you have with DC motors where you have carbon brushes, which are a high maintenance item. Some places in DC motors and generators, like in your car, for instance, a starter has got brushes in it. There's no way around that. But then again, the starter does not run for many, many hours. Uh, well, when, when we lived in Illinois from uh, 1995 to 2000, when uh, I was working at the... Uh, Dresden nuclear power station out there, uh, we had moved into a new townhouse and our air conditioning was controlled by the power company and we got an approved rate. When it was warm, you know, it would be off for maybe half an hour. I, we never even timed it or bothered with it because we really didn't notice it. So what they were obviously doing was shutting off one big block of people on air conditioning for 30 minutes then shutting off another block and restarting the first and rotating it around. In that way, they could limit the peak demand on the system because out there and here in New England, we are now a summer peaking grid, which means in the summer, that's when the most electricity is used. And it's hot summer days, sunny days, because of air conditioning. So, matter of fact, uh, Cliff Bilo, who used to be uh, our state senator, and uh, is tied in with the PUC, uh, found out that we used, we had 10% of our generation was there for just about 10% of the time in the, in, of the whole year, those peaks. And, you know, that's an expensive extra generation. So ways to be more efficient, ways to use less air conditioning are worthwhile. Okay, I'm going to show some pictures of some hardware just to give you an idea of the size and scope. You know, when people talk about changing <coughs> to something else, uh, we're going to be abandoning uh, or replacing something that's with something that's equal to this. This is the uh, rotor for a steam turbine. Okay, acts like a pinwheel. The steam goes through it and makes it turn around. But you can see the, uh, the people in there relative size. This would probably be uh, from something like this, which is a large steam turbine for generating electricity. 
uh, those big rotors would be under the yellow hoods and then you have a high pressure turbine here. But this would be in the million horsepower class. And what temperature is the steam? Million, pin, hmm? million megawatts? Huh? Uh, well, a million megawatts. Or no, a million kilowatts. Thousand kilowatts, megawatts. Thousand megawatts. Yeah. Thousand megawatts. There is only one temperature for steam unless it's under pressure, right? Oh, yeah, no, but it's under high pressure to get the energy out of it. T2. Um, Keep yeah, raising that T2. Way up there. Um, I can't remember right now that you're talking about 900,000 degrees, way up there. Um, okay, more big hardware. Uh, these are hydroelectric generators. Many of them uh, limited really by the size of the water wheel. Uh, here's a wind turbines with the associated switch arm. This is a high voltage transmission station. You see these around. Uh, lots of big hardware and you can tell the voltage by the length of the insulators. The higher the voltage, the more insulation you need. Here's an AC to DC uh, converter. You can, you can see the people. Yeah, see the people. <laughs> you can tell the size of it, you know. Look at those things sticking out of it. What, what? It looked like um, guns on a ship. <laughs> yeah, well, those are insulators. Oh, okay. You, know, you long. need long insulators it's, because of the very high voltage. Yeah. Typically, you're at a million volts DC uh, for efficiency of transmission. Here's some one thing you see locally, a local transformer to get it down for use. We have a couple near our house. Here is our grid in New England. Uh, and it shows the tie points uh, to our neighbors and to the eastern interconnection. Uh, we're an island electrically with bridges which are limited in capacity. Okay? We can share either way, but uh, I believe that all those interconnections couldn't supply all of New England by any means, and they weren't intended to. Uh, interesting story along uh, that line. In 19, early 60s, uh, early 50s, and the late 50s, when the government was promoting nuclear power, uh, utilities in New England got together and said, you know, we're an island, and electrically and energy-wise, we're at the end of everybody's pipeline. We don't have any coal, we don't have any oil, we don't have any gas, so we gotta bring all that in from outside. Why don't we try out nuclear power? So they did, they formed the, uh, the Yankee Atomic Electric Company to develop New England and built several plants. But it was true then, it was true now, we're at the end of everybody's pipeline. Now it's natural gas, what we're doing most of it. Moving on. Here's a schematic from ISO New England of the smart grid. Uh, did anybody get a chance to read up on the smart grid? or? The government's got a website on it. What the smart grid means is the federal government has a website on it, which is very instructive. What the smart grid means is distribution wires the way we have now, but not only two-way flow of power, but two-way flow of communications. So not only the endpoints know what's going on, but also the dispatcher knows what's going on and can control things throughout the grid. Um, we'll get to, not only using the example of our air conditioning, uh, we'll get to the point where uh, they can control other things or send you, send you signals to your house about what the price of power is. So you can decide whether to turn a washing machine on or not, or you'll be able to program it so that it can come on when power is cheap. I know some friends I worked with in California from Germany said, ah, for years we've had red and green lights over the washing machine, you know, mm -hmm. high cost, low cost, you know. So there have been all kinds of efforts for many years. But that's a smart grid. Now the grid that is, uh, de it's developing from, and this is showing it in a developed condition by ISO, 
the tributes are kind of generation we have now, wind, of course you can call this pump storage too, and this central plant would recognize, uh, represent all fossil and also nuclear, any kind of central station generation. Then you have transmission, high voltage transmission, transforming low voltage local uses. You've got grid connected solar power, a number of which are in use right now, commercial size uh, solar installations just for selling electricity to the grid. What's not shown here is grid scale batteries which are under development. Uh, matter of fact, the uh, Elon Musk company is running a 100 megawatt one in Australia right now, tied in with wind as a demonstration. Uh, this would be a demand resource here. It has its own generator and can also be turned on and off. This customer is not a demand resource. Here you have houses, solar panels, cars plugged in, and you can assume batteries in all those houses too. Uh, perhaps we'll get back to something that the uh, power companies were doing in the early part of the 20th century. They would sell you a water heater or a stove or what have you that was electric, and you would essentially be renting it from them, but they were responsible for it. Uh, why, I, and of course they had to repair it too. I don't know why we couldn't go back to doing the same thing with batteries in the houses, because the homeowner is going to need somebody to help them with the service of all those things. And the other thing which I think we'll see in the future, not only electric cars plugged in at home for charging, but you'll see them plugged in at work. Not so much for charging, but with many, many cars plugged in, they'll be able to back up the grid too. And of course with computer control, you'll be able to determine how much energy is available from all those batteries and all those cars. And if the dispatcher draws from those cars while they're at work, then the people will get paid for it. Here's the ISO New England control room, which you will be seeing when we go down there in two weeks. Uh, the, this shows all the major points in New England, not everything by any means, but everything that's important for their operation. They do not control everything from here. Many signals go to local controls for the individual utilities in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, and so forth. Uh, but they control a lot of the big things. Okay. Grid management must take into account the following. Societal events, forecasted load too, based on experience and weather, maintenance going underway or emergency maintenance, damage, must have reserve in case the largest source of generation trips off the line, can't knock the grid off. So that if you look at all the generation, you say, oh, and some critics have say, Oh, gee, there's lots of energy available. They've got 20% more generation than the peak use. Well, that's to take care of the contingencies. It's not because it's extra. Uh, and they have to balance the sources they're using, not only base load, which is power, a term which means the power that is used all the time. Day and night, there's a certain amount of power used. And if you have a generator that wants to run at full load all the time, that's your base load. Nuclear power plants were designed that way. Not that they can't go up and down, but they were designed to be economical and run continuously at full power. Uh, intermediate means use of electricity, electricity for a good part of the day. And then peaking is even more electricity for a short time. So the boundaries for those are a little fuzzy, but they're what they call them. Can, can I tell some an amusing, yeah. vaguely amusing story about societal events? There's a little YouTube somewhere which shows this guy in England and he's, uh, he's, 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 at a, he's in a dispatch center and he's watching a TV screen. And the reason he's watching a TV screen is when the big soccer match takes a break 
everybody's going to go and turn on their electric kettle. And so that's when he's going to order up some more power. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, well, same thing would be like on the Super Bowl here. Yeah. And, he, and he, that's what I mean by societal events. And uh, in that same vein, not only do they run and turn on the tea kettle, they run to the bathroom, too. <laughs> so the people that want controlling the water system, they see a big drop in pressure when everybody flushes their toilet at the same time. Okay, and of course it must maintain voltage and frequency within limits because many, much of the connected equipment depends upon voltage and frequency within a certain range. And as I learned from the operators out in Ludington, the dispatchers have a cycle counter and they count the number of cycles generated in an hour. And they speed up or slow down so you wind up with exactly 216,000 cycles every hour in 60 cycle current. So this is the control challenge. It's a constant balancing act. And I think that's important to keep in mind because if something goes awry, the scale can jump one way or the other, it can crash down or raise up. And of course, as we know, it's happened a few times, but uh, until we have enough grid scale batteries to instantly provide power, as happens with your car or submarines and so forth, that instantly flows to make up the grid, we will have this challenge. What about so-called uninterrupted power supply devices? They're, they're designed to be just what they say. They have some batteries and they immediately switch to the batteries when, and then also we'll start a generator or something else when the, trend, the incoming line from the power company goes down. Well, there's, a, there's a good example of uninterruptible power supply and that relates to trading on Wall Street. Ah. <laughs> what? Trading on Wall Street. So you have an identical setup in, Wall, in Manhattan and another one in New Jersey and they operate in parallel. So if one goes down, the one in New Jersey just takes over and nobody knows the difference on, on the floor, on the trading floor. So the one in Manhattan, it has a floor of batteries <coughs> and it has diesel generators. So when it is down, it of course is immediately attended to in order to bring it back up again. And so you always have two systems and that the downtime of one system is kept to a minimum because you don't want to have the other system goes down and having chaos on the market. So that's how this is set up with Wall Street. They have two systems operating in parallel, oper connected to the fiber optic cable that's dedicated to these two systems. Everybody has it. Nobody has an outage. <laughs> I used to design those systems. Yeah, good thing. Wow. Yeah, and of course, as you point out, hospitals have the same thing, you know, to keep things going. Um, power plants, for instance, have uh, DC lights, which will pick up on their battery if they have an outage till they get power back. Uh, same thing we had on submarines, of course, and. Uh, all kinds of important things have that. And as you'll find out when you get to ISO, I've made the trick before, but going again, but they have a backup control room. That control room you saw, they have an identical one, which is a backup. They have two identical ones. Two actually. identical ones Yeah, now? One, in, one, one in ISO in the basement, I gather, and one off-site in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> If you have a, a they'll tell you. I, they'll tell you when you're there. I, I'm pretty sure there's there's one there's one at their site and one in Connecticut. I know there's one in Connecticut. If you have a big power plant, at every station you have not one pump but two pumps, and sometimes you have three 50 percent pumps. Now, if one pump goes down, they have another pump in the warehouse that immediately replaces the pump that is down. Mm 
system overnight. They don't want ever having any equipment down. It's belts and suspenders in the utility industry. So they have a, a big warehouse full of equipment, of equipment that is being used in the plant. In case of a piece of equipment going down, they don't want to spend ordering this and getting it delivered in two or three weeks. They already have it on the shelf. They just roll it out, install it overnight, and nobody knows the difference. That's how power plants are run. That's why they are able to deliver 99.97 reliability of electricity. That's the only way they do it, by having redundancy of equipment at all the critical points. Yeah. And redundancy for the grid and pump storage. I'll get to that in a minute. Howard? Yeah, yeah. I want yes. To... On that point, you mentioned grid batteries. Yeah. Do they exist? Yeah. Well, they're no, they're, no, no. They don't. We don't have them the now. Grid. But I said Elon Musk is testing one oh. in Australia right okay. now, with along with a wind farm, which is grid scale. But it has to be huge. Well, yeah, but you have the wind. It says you would charge the battery when the wind is there, and then you would use it when you need it. You know? Let me let me also point out though that the battery Musk is testing is a hundred megawatts. Any power plant, even a small one, is several hundred megawatts to thousands of megawatts to a thousand megawatts. So, I I don't like the idea that his battery is truly grid scale yet. Okay. Well, I, I just want it, it, to, it, it's getting there, it's more, it's more than your car battery, right? But it's uh, it, 100 megawatts is not, even Vermont Yankee, which was a small plant, 600 megawatts. Well, yeah. just a second. With the, the Musk battery in Australia, it's a 100 megawatt battery, but 129 megawatt hours. So, the wind turbines that are nearby are French wind turbines. And their output goes up and down. And in order to avoid the disturbances on the grid of this variable output of the wind turbines, these batteries basically serve to smooth out that wind turbine output. So they really work together. So that's a $50 million addition to the wind turbine invest capital. They operate as a tandem. They really have nothing to do with grid scale. It's basically amending the deficiencies of the output of wind systems. They don't put out a steady output. They put out a variable output. These variations disturb the grid. To minimize the disturbance, these batteries feed in as needed to, to, to keep the grid frequencies and voltages within acceptable limits, because if that's not done, other equipment will just trip out. I'm going to interrupt everybody now because I'm a great believer in taking cookie breaks. <laughs> and it's now uh, 10 o'clock, and I don't like it. We're, this is a fascinating conversation. It's always going to be one. And I figure it's my duty to make sure that we have a, 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 a break. So uh, if people can come back in, uh, in about 10 minutes, that would be, uh, that would be great. Well, and, uh, yeah, I think we're set to, to go again. Okay. Management of the Grid of Continuous Balancing Act. Moving on. We came, Meredith and I came up with this idea to explain how the grid works when talking about financing. Sorry for a little blurry. But imagine a bicycle chain going around to a lot of different suppliers and a lot of different users. Each supplier has a sprocket on the chain, and each user has a sprocket on the chain. And the suppliers are pushing, pulling the chain one way, pulling it the other, like the alternating current. And the users are getting pulled one way and then pulled the other way. So a, us a user on this side and a supplier on that side are only experiencing the chain. But the accounting fiction is that you can buy power from that guy on the other side. 
but that's an accounting fiction. You're paying the amount that he charges, and you're getting it. But nothing's coming from that plant to you. Okay, it's only the chain that's transmitting. So that's an accounting fiction. You know, and there's some uh, deals that com power company has, oh, you can buy green power from down in Connecticut or something else, you know. It's not coming to you. It's just pushing the chain or pulling the chain. Okay, this is beautiful. Yeah, this is the Ludington Pump Storage Project in Michigan. At the time, uh, I was there as a lead startup engineer for the building. When it was built and went into service in 1972, it was the largest in the world. Now there's ones that are bigger. Eastern Shore of Lake Michigan, uh, that's the lower reservoir. That's the upper reservoir. That road is six miles long around there. Wow. Huge wow. plant. Wow. What's the elevation difference? Uh, the elevation is about 360 feet different, so it's not very high elevation. Because the elevation is not high comparatively, as Willem points out, the generators had to turn at 112 and a half RPM to be the most efficient speed uh, for the water wheel. Uh, this plant was connected to the 345,000 uh, volt grid that connected Michigan, Ontario, northern Indiana, and eastern Illinois. Thank you. Okay. So at nighttime when they were pumping, they were getting power up from the nuclear power plants down south uh, to pump up. And in the daytime, they were generating as needed uh, to support the grid. Plant was also designed for black starting. And as Gentleman Tank pointed out, all that water up there is like a battery. Stored energy, so that with a diesel engine, you could get enough electricity to start up the first machine and start using that water and generating. Then that generator could start other generators in the powerhouse and re-energize the grid. It, it's not only pump storage plants which are designed to black start the grid if the whole grid goes down, which has happened on a couple of occasions, but other plants have diesel generators, uh, not pump storage, they're small uh, gas plants and oil plants which can start up rapidly to, to energize the grid. Then the bigger plants, which require grid power to start up, can start up. What's the name of this place? This is Ludington, Michigan. Okay, you can look it up online, Eastern Shore of Lake. There's something like this in Northfield. Yeah, Mass Northfield, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, but it's much smaller. And than Bear Northfield, Swamp in Massachusetts, in uh, North Adams, Massachusetts. So, yes. Have they had uh, environmental problems with this? Or some, some. Uh, from what I picked up, there's been some leakage from the reservoir out underground, and you see there's farms and stuff around here, and. Nothing much on the lake because it's so big, although when we were first using it, when you had the uh, trout migration up the lake, because they're, uh, they're seeded from fish farms into a river upstream of the plant, or up the lake, so a few of those fish would get caught in here and the environmentalists were upset. It was kind of amusing to us because when you went upstream when those trout returned to the place where they had been seeded. Fishermen were up there pulling them in left and right by the hundreds. <laughs> so, so the plant was taking a, one or two or three away, and the fishermen were taking hundreds. So, uh, but because of the large size of the lake, there hasn't been any other environmental problems that I know of. Okay, move on. What's the head on that? Uh, I think just 360 feet, which is not great for hydroelectric, but uh, that's the best they could do at that location. Uh, if, if the elevation was much higher, if the difference was much higher between the powerhouse and the reservoir, then the reservoir could be smaller for the same amount of power and energy. Okay, this is just a quick illustration of the effect of solar on the grid. This is when the sun's shining and you're getting solar electricity. This is what the demand is otherwise. This is what it would be, the dotted line, without solar. And of course, when solar stops, then the dispatcher has to be back to the normal demand. Okay, just quickly, a few things on commercial batteries that are going on. Uh, these are 10 megawatt hour batteries. There's a town in Massachusetts that has a battery system which will supply the police and uh, 
town hall and other things in town, as well as a good bit of the town offices if the grid goes down, but they also sell back to the grid. Uh, this is a commercial representation of what somebody believes can be done with solar power. When the sun's shining, you're charging batteries. It takes a lot of solar panels and a lot of batteries <laughs> when you talk about grid scale. And that's something that I don't hear talked about much. Okay, fine. How many of these are going to be required? Where are they going to be? What will be the environmental impact of building them? And what's the cost? Uh, here's somebody who had done a comparison on batteries compared to pump storage and compressed air, just to give you an idea that there's real commercial activity going on. Uh, historical grid problems, a big blackout in 1965, uh, which led to the formation of Nipool. Uh, my wife was in New York City for that, and I, I, I was out to sea on a submarine, so. But uh, I didn't experience that. But the, what? You had power. Yeah, we had power, right. And it was very interesting. That was the whole Northeast. 2003 was the North Central blackout. Started in Ohio. New England disconnected as a grid started to collapse and kept going. Uh, 2011, big storm with many, many lines damaged. And just mentioning the Lowell Mountain Wind Farm, when it first went into use uh, in Vermont, uh, it couldn't come to full power because of disrupting the grid at full power. You know more about that, Willow. Uh, in order to come to full power and make the governor happy, political interference here, uh, they had to put in a synchronous condenser to tune it up to match the grid. and. You can put in another line, too, as you said, right? This raises the point that people say, well, we'll do solar here, we'll do wind here, and so we'll do batteries here. Yes, but it's not just like plugging in. There's more to it than that. In your house, you can't plug in everything everywhere, or you can't take an electric stove and plug it into a 120 outlet. You know, there's only so far you can go. That's the point of uh, including that in this discussion. Quickly on grid security, of course, vulnerable to cyber attack now. Carrington events are sun sunspots, which when you have a sunspot and a big eruption of material that comes to the earth, uh, it'll generate power in the transmission lines, which act like the antennas, and it can damage equipment and cause quite a bit of damage. You know, we're in the process, I believe, of making changes, but these are very, very rare events. The first one was before the Civil War, uh, then in 1989 there was one that caused equipment damage in Quebec, and some other time there was one that uh, caused uh, damage in South America. I believe the damage is more severe close to the poles because of the shape of the Earth's magnetic field. So you come to the poles, it directs uh, the material generation toward the poles and political error uh, from getting generating sources which can't be backed up, not considering everything. Can those sunspots be predicted? Not really, but they can see them when they happen. And it takes uh, quite a few hours for the material that's ejected from the sun to get to the earth. So that the light comes right away, but then for the, the material that's ejected takes time. Uh, in 2012, there was one, uh, but it missed the Earth. Because if you're on the sun and the Earth is way out, that's a pretty small target. And the eruptions from the sun can go in any direction. So there's odds that you're not going to get them very often. But when they do happen, it can be severe. OK, conclusion. The grid is vital to our lives and economy. It's complex. When the grid is providing power, it's being generated somewhere either by generators or, in the future, batteries. There's a tiny instant storage now, but that's not supporting the whole grid. That's only for hospitals or other things like that, or people's houses where they have batteries. The grid is ultimately controlled by people, and uh, there are computer assists now, and there'll be many more in the future. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Quick. Is there any other line of work or any other business where a 66% scrap rate is acceptable? <laughs> Not that I, I don't know. Well, of course, driving your car, running buses, you know, you've got 
that's the laws of thermodynamics, you know. You yeah, everybody two, really. Two thirds of the energy. Uh, cars are a little higher, so that instead of two thirds, they might be uh, uh, only 60% loss yeah, for cars and diesels and everything else. So the answer is yes, because you're limited by the uh, laws of thermodynamics. Well, my People really hated when Sadie Carnot came up with this. They were very, very upset. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing is, it is a direct consequence of the second law of thermodynamics. And that means that if you run a heat engine, you, you really have only, the only way you can get it higher is to hit uh, T2 higher. That's your, that's your gasoline car, your gasoline lawnmower, everything. Yeah, it's your car, your lawnmower, your power plant. It runs a heat engine. Please, I'm sorry. No, sorry. Oh, well, my question was similar in a sense. I was, I was wondering whether the ability to use that heat recovery in other ways, i.e., you know, warming a greenhouse or whatever, oh, you is could. factored in Definitely. to the permitting or licensing process or the planning process. You have a story about that, right? When Vermont Yankees was set up, they wanted to do that, but they were not allowed to do it. As I remember, it was a, you wanted to heat the um, the office building with heat from yeah, or have a greenhouse or a fish farm, but then you run into the question: What happens when the plant shut down for maintenance? And suppose it shuts down in the winter, then the greenhouse all freezes. Well, you have to have another boiler for that. So the economics become uh, prohibitive unless you have several plants together. So there's a lot of efforts going on for that, but. It's that kind of question that you have to ask. What happens when the plants start running? What happens in my greenhouse or fish farm or whatever? Okay, I think we need to move on Yeah, we on should to move on to Willem. Um, I just, uh, uh, one person, uh, one time I was talking to um, someone and uh, I was explaining that it's very hard to talk about energy and, and so forth and, and, and um, my friend said to me, well, Meredith, what you are is a grief counselor when people understand the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, and, and you can use a waste heat if you can arrange to use it to heat something. But the whole point is the only way to get more energy, electricity out is to raise that T2. And, and, and we're kind of stuck with our materials. Our materials can take only a certain level of T2. So that's an excellent question. It's a great about question. Using the waste heat. And people are looking that seriously all the time, but you run into those kinds of problems. What happens when the heat stops for whatever it is you're heating? Okay, you Willem, now, uh, you've got half an hour. I'm sorry, it isn't longer. But it's been an interesting discussion, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> which are posted on a main website. The reason for posting them on the main website because since I'm not perfect, I make corrections to my article and no one interferes on that site when I make corrections to my articles. And I make many corrections. So the first article that I want to talk about is about a housing development in northern Vermont. And the housing development consists of seven double wide units that are made in White River Junction. They're highly insulated and sealed. And each unit is 12 feet wide and 60 feet long. And and the next unit is abutted next to it, so it looks like a double wide. And each unit has solar panels on the roof, it has a battery, it has heat pumps for heating and cooling, and it has a heat pump for the domestic hot water. It has a, uh, a, a, a heat exchanger that exchanges, uh, recovers the heat, and there's any waste heat that you send out for refreshment, the incoming heat 
is warmed up by the heat that you send out, by the, by the air that you send out. So these buildings, of course, will have very low uh, electric bills and very low heating and cooling bills because the, the solar panels, there are 6 kW, which is actually quite a lot for a unit that's only 720 square feet. And, but that output of these panels is about 1,250 kilowatt hour per, per kilowatt, so times six, which is around seven and a half thousand kilowatt hour. And that's sufficient to basically provide all the heating and cooling and the domestic hot water. If, that, if the units are connected to the grid, because there will be many hours, like today and in the winter, when the sun isn't shining, and of course they have to have electricity from the grid to make up the shortfall, whereas in the summer there's much more electricity, then they send it to the grid and Green Mountain Power keeps account of what is sent to the grid and, and, and then feeds it back in in the winter so that all thing gets balanced by Green Mountain Power. <coughs> now the cost of these units is very expensive because these are basically uh, mobile mobile homes, well you might, you know, manufactured homes, factory built homes. And uh, they cost about $260,000 a piece. So all the, the, the people that live in these units they don't own them. The entire capital cost was provided by various entities, and Table 1 shows you the list of the entities providing the capital cost. And some of the companies, some of the entities that provided <coughs> some of the capital, such as Efficiency Demand, Green Mountain Power, and Clean Energy Group, and uh, the Sonnen batteries, which are German batteries, they were provided at a 30% discount. So, in order to make this work, just about all of this $4 million, $3.7 million for these 14 units was, in one way or another, a donation, which, of course, has a cost to it. Nothing comes for free. Everything has a cost, and that cost gets borne by everybody. Uh, there is no free lunch in the world. But the people who live in those uh, units, they are low-income people, and they cannot afford to pay rent. So they pay a minimal amount of rent, a few hundred dollars a month, maybe 500 numbers in that order. And, uh, and of course, they're very happy that they were accommodated in that manner. But in just in Vermont, there probably will be about 25,000 such families that would qualify to live in these units. And if there weren't that many units available, they would line up to live in there because their alternative is much more expensive. But the cost of that, 25,000 times 262,000, that's, you know, <laughs> close to $10 billion. So that's, that's just not a, uh, it's, it's good to have something like this for demonstration purposes, but to show that technology works for highly efficient buildings, the technology meaning the heat pumps. Heat pumps, by definition, do not work with buildings that are high, not highly efficient. They have to be highly insulated, and they have to have very little leakage, and they're very highly sealed. There have been a lot of enthusiastic contractors and various organizations that promote these heat pumps, and they've been putting them into buildings that are completely unsuitable for 
heat pumps. And as a result, instead of getting a coefficient of performance of 2.5 to 2.7, you get a coefficient of performance of 1.2. Instead of savings of a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars that people were told that they would be getting, they're having savings of three hundred dollars. Well, that's entirely due to the fact that the buildings are unsuitable. But contractors, you know, they like to make money, install this equipment, and then of course later on, the Department of uh, Public Service in Vermont did a study of actual installations and actual performance and found that these savings were much smaller and that the performance of these heat pumps was a lot poorer. Yes, ma'am? But the coefficient of performance is um, specific to the heat pump. It doesn't have anything to do with what it's connected to. Oh, yes. If a heat pump operates at part load, that reduces the coefficient of performance. If it uh, cycles on and off, that reduces the coefficient of performance. So the best way for a heat pump to work is in a building that has a long time constant. In other words, it slows down, it, it cools down slowly, and it heats up slowly. So the heat pump just follows that slow sine wave that happens every day. That's fine, but the, most houses, they cool down in a few hours. The heat pumps, pumps, and then it just stops, and then pumps again and stops. It doesn't just keep going. On, and on cold days, it's of course disastrous because the heat pump has a lower coefficient of performance on cold days anyway because it has to use this low outside temperature as its temperature difference. And if you look at the rating sheet on heat pumps, they're rated at 47 degree ambient, but they may be operating at 20 degree below or 10 degree below. Well, at, that, at those low temperatures, a heat pump has very low coefficient performance and you're almost using electric heat. The one, one, one would be electric heat, the 1.2 is not too far away from electric heat. And you're using, you're having that low coefficient performance at a time when the temperature is low and you're using a lot of heat. So that's exactly not to have it, you see. So that means that these houses that have these heat pumps use their systems that they had before, the regular furnaces, many more hours than they had expected to. As a result, they have much less savings. Right, but they, that's not, the coefficient of performance of the heat pump is specific to the heat pump and not... It is the house. It is the house. The, the heat house. pump is a wonderful piece of equipment. There's a lot of engineering went into this. There's nothing wrong with the heat pump. It's the house. Can I make a comment? It's also the outside temperature. Yeah, the, the outside coefficient temperature. of performance oh, depends sure. oh, heavily sure. oh, on sure. the outside temperature. When the outside temperature is low, the coefficient goes down. Right. Right. And I, I feel like we have to say that about heat pumps because it isn't just like, oh, it's got a 1.8. It's got a 1.8, as you said, at 47 degrees or whatever. Yeah, right. right. I, I agree, but it, I mean, it, it changes with the outside temperature, but it doesn't. <laughs> it's not affected by what it's but that, But that's an additional factor. It is. If, it is in the overall energy use. I yeah. totally agree with that. Yeah. But coefficient of performance is specific to the to the Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. And, okay. and the, okay. if, in any kind of new built house, you should use geothermal. You just mm -hmm. dig a big hole eight feet deep or six feet deep and lay down coils. The temperature is independent from the outside temperature. It stays constant throughout the year, and you, that is a much more efficient system because your coefficient of performance, it could be six or seven, not 2.5 or 2.7, but six or seven. So these geothermal systems, which are a lot more expensive, but they, of course, 
require very little energy for heating and cooling. So if you're building a big house, you know, not a small place, but a big house, you want to go geothermal. And a, a new house. But an existing house that, well, <laughs> my brother-in-law who lives in Norway, the Norwegian government dictated that everybody has to have, can no longer use uh, propane and, and, and fuel oil, etc., for heating their houses. So he put in a geothermal house, a geothermal system, in an existing house, which of course is about 50 years old, and uh, is well built and all that, but the cost was $100,000. You know, so it has a deep well that's over a thousand feet deep, and that well acts as a underground heat source. Now in the winter, the heat is taken from the well and brought inside the house by the pump, and in the summer vice versa. That was the cold from the well is brought into the house to cool the house, and of course. It works wonderfully, according to my sister-in-law. <laughs> but they well, spent a lot of money. dollars. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, that. Any questions about heat pumps? Is there a concern about air exchange if you have a highly insulated house to uh, support a heat pump? How, how do you get uh, adequate air exchange to prevent moisture buildup? Oh, you need to have, if you, if you have a highly sealed and highly insulated house, you have to have an air-to-air -air heat exchanger. In other words, you bring in fresh air and you send out stale air, and you that heat exchanger basically heats up the incoming cold air and, and from the outgoing warm air. And those units are about 85% efficient. So that is a way of, of, of get, maintaining fresh air conditions in your house. And um, it, it is of course better to have mini split units that, you know, that it's okay to have them, you know, they have part of their equipment on the outside and, and one on the, or part of the equipment on the inside. And, uh, it's, and they have no ducts. The, the, for, for, it is better to have a distribution system in terms of ducts, because then you can regulate the amount of uh, heating and cooling that goes to each room. And you can also regulate the amount of ventilation from each room by means of the ductwork. And so that, that would be the better way to go but that's, that you want to do that in a newly built house. Can't really be very difficult to do in an existing house. So, it's probably close to 80% of all buildings and houses that are really unsuitable for heat pumps, unless they have a deep retrofit. You know, you have to spend probably 20, 30,000 bucks to put in New windows, new doors, you know, the other equipment, the heat pumps, insulation, you know, R40 walls, R60 ceiling, R20 basement. This is the kind of thing you're talking about when you have a highly insulated and sealed house. And, and that's when heat pumps work fine. Nothing wrong with the heat pumps. It's just the house they're not ready for this kind of sophisticated equipment. Well, not according to the contractors. The contractors, they of course <laughs> think every house is ready for, for that equipment. Any questions? Uh, just a comment. We went, we went to a talk where a guy had done a deep retrofitting of his home and he had to take out a mortgage to do it. But the monthly payments were no more than what he was paying for all the energy he was using and leaking yeah. before the retrofit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he, uh, 
he, he probably was much better off. If people live in a house that they were much more comfortable. Yeah, yeah, much more comfortable. You know, a lot of pluses. And if you live in a house that's an energy hog house, and you do a major retrofit, then of course after that you're in heaven. Mm -hmm. Everything is so much better. It's no longer drafty and cold. It's roasty toasty. And the heat pumps <laughs> keep you warm, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, but that takes money to do this. If you go online and you say, well, we retrofitted this old house and, and did all this and that, they, that was major work. And usually there are subsidies from the state that help out to do this. And, and you know, people doing this on their own, you have to have a very deep pocketbook to do this. But if you have a valuable house, you know, valuable building, architectural, <laughs> You know, you it's a certain neighborhood, you want to do that, <coughs> and you have pocketbook deep enough, then you can do this. You can take or that you, old or house you get a and a mortgage. <laughs> you know, that's right. You can take that old house and turn it into a comfortable, pleasant place that is heated with heat pumps. You can. Can I make a little comment? That I'm not exactly sure how this works, but there is a program called PACE, P-A-C-E, mm -hmm. which is a way to, um, to get mortgages for energy efficiency improvements. Um, it's not available everywhere, but it is available in at least parts of Vermont, and so you, you might want to look into it if you're thinking of doing this. My second article is on, is on electric vehicles. The issue here is, suppose you want to change all the light duty vehicles in New England to electric vehicles. Just the light duty vehicles. These are the cars, the minivans, the SUVs, the quarter ton pickups, both short wheelbase and long wheelbase. Convert them all to electric vehicles. Then the increase in the load on the grid, which the total load on the grid in 2017 was about 122 terawatt hours. A terawatt hour is a billion kilowatt hour. So 122 billion kilowatt hours was the total load on the grid. If you take, convert all these vehicles that currently exist in all six states to electric vehicles, you would add about at least 56 terawatt hours to the grid, which makes the grid completely inadequate. I mean, of course, that's an, an extreme situation. All the vehicles would be electric. People will say, oh, but some vehicles will use biofuels. Well, I have some articles out on biofuels. <coughs> I don't know what that would mean, what that would imply. Getting biofuels from corn, for example, or biofuels from soy, soybeans, and uh, biodiesel from soybeans. And uh, the land area required to do this would be far larger than all the acreage we have in agriculture several times larger than all the acreage the U.S. has in agriculture. So unless there is a biofuel ways of, of producing those type of fuels in a much more concentrated fashion, you know, thousands of gallons per acre instead of hundreds of gallons per acre, it is just not feasible. So, so to, to even think in terms of, oh, we will have biodiesel, we have biofuel <coughs> instead of electrics, that's just not in the cards. In a, in a small percentage, you can have that, but not in any big percentage. There just does, is not enough acreage. Plus, the fuels just haven't been developed. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no kind of quantities that are not existing. And there's nothing on the horizon that even indicates that they would be existing. So you can't really rule those in. So you're, you're back to 
turning everything to electric. But then the electric adds to the load on the grid, which renders the grid overloaded, inadequate. So that's not the only situation. Yeah. Gee, because, <laughs> because if you first insulate and seal all the houses, these deep retrofits that I was talking about, and then as you do that, also introduce the heat pumps into these houses, which would be logical, no question about it, and solar panels on, on these houses, so they would be producing some of their own electricity, or maybe all of it, then you would add still a load to the New England grid due to the heat pumps operating, let's say in the winter, when solar energy from your solar panels on the roof is minimal. Yet your heating load is maximal. It's cold. So the heat pumps would place a big burden on the grid in the winter. Right? So here it was already overloaded by just going from gasoline to electricity on your vehicles by going from furnaces to heat pumps, it would certainly be overloaded even more in the winter. We're talking about requiring a grid that is twice as large. Now, if you do these retrofits, then of course you greatly reduce the amount of electricity that these retrofitted buildings would use. Because you know, they're much more efficient. Probably cut that in half. That would make available capacity on the grid to add in the heat pumps. You see. In other words, it is essential to deep retrofit just about all the buildings in New England in order to be able to use heat pumps. And it is essential to increase the capacity of the grid in order to be able to avoid gasoline and use electricity. Then the big other problem is where would that electricity be generated? Of course, some of it would be generated on roofs, but some of it could be generated south of Martha's Vineyards offshore, but there are times when there is no wind and a snowstorm, there is no solar, all the panels are covered. So you need other generation or storage to fill in the hole. And the hole can be very big if you say, oh, all of our electricity on the grid on an annual basis is uh, from wind and solar. Well, when wind and solar are not there, you're going to have that big hole. And you can be connected to New York or to Canada, but they're not going to be able to fill that hole. That only can come from generators that are here or from storage. Right? We're talking terawatt hour storage. Storage that is not 100 megawatt hours, but a billion kilowatt hour, which is terawatt hour, we're talking multiples of those. Now, the current cost of storage is about $400 a kilowatt hour. So if you're talking about a billion, that's $400 billion for one terawatt hour. So you multiply that out times five or eight, numbers like that. People have made analyses of this talking to trillions of dollars just for storage. Now you can also use, of course, natural gas. There are basically three sources of natural gas. There's Pennsylvania, there is uh, natural gas from Louisiana, 
or natural gas from Russia and the Middle East and some other countries. And um, the one from Louisiana, that you cannot bring that in because of the Jones Act, which requires that the tanker would be U.S. owned, it would be U.S. registered, and U.S. crewed. There are no such tankers in the world. So the Jones Act would have to be changed and, you know, some investors would have to step up to the plate to buy tankers, etc. Right now, all of those are <coughs> vessels. If the LNG was coming from Louisiana to Massachusetts, New England, so it's more likely that it would come from Russia, Middle East, or other countries. Now, the LNG is about $9 a million BTUs landed here. The gas from Pennsylvania is about $270 to $3 per million BTUs. The from Louisiana is about $5 a million BTUs, $6, numbers like that. Right now, we're getting a lot of LNG from Trinidad, but Trinidad gas fields are declining. So they could not possibly provide more of what we would need. This electricity for the, that we would need to generate for the uh, electric vehicles, that couldn't be generated with wind and solar because people have to get to work. So there has to be a reliable supply of electricity to charge those vehicles. And that happens every day. So if you have a wind or solar lull of three or five days, you look outside, there's no wind and there's no sun. So you have to have a reliable source of electricity. That can be from gas turbines. Now gas turbines, they operate at a very high temperature and that's where Meredith or no cycle comes in. There's several thousand degrees in their combustion chamber as a result, T2 is very high, and the efficiency is very high. So gas turbines is the way to go. They're 50% efficient. They can even be 60% efficient. But if we take 50% efficient and use gas, we, we have a reasonable number. That gas has to come from somewhere. The gas turbines would be in addition to the existing gas turbines the electricity for the vehicles is in addition to the existing electricity. And the amount, we already know, it's about 56 terawatt hours. That, that's the amount that has to go, that has to be generated. So to double the amount is the energy that has to be fed to the gas turbines, because they're 50% efficient. That's the, that's the amount in terawatt hours that we have to have as LNG coming into the country if we don't get it from Pennsylvania. If we get it from Pennsylvania, we need additional pipelines and we need storage tanks, you know, big storage systems to smooth out the flow. Uh, there are people who are opposed to more pipelines from Pennsylvania. <coughs> That's, that's domestic pipelines, you know, domestic natural gas. And they would rather have imported natural gas at three times the price. That would, of course, be very bad for the New England economy. We're not talking a small quantity here. We're talking a major increase in the electricity requirement due to going to electric vehicles. And that would, you know, New England already has the highest electric rates in all of the U.S. Can't and, the U.S., and, Hi, Hawaii. <laughs> well, Hawaii, <laughs> the continental U.S., so we're leaving out Alaska and, and Hawaii. And, uh, and, and that would make it worse, you know, using, starting using high-cost LNG to make electricity for electric vehicles. That would make that worse. So 
you know, it would be very much shooting yourself in the foot. Now, this would be very much in the interest of the Europeans and the Japanese and the Koreans because they like us to be using high-cost energy. They are using high-cost energy because they don't have it. They have to import it. That's why they have high-cost energy. What do you think happens to us when we import our energy? It will also be high cost. It will be from Middle East to Russia, just like it goes to Europe from the Middle East and Russia. It goes, it would come from, from there to us at high cost, making us as a country less efficient vis-a-vis -vis Korea, Japan, and Europe. These are our trading partners. They want us to be handicapped because it puts us not in a good place. You see, they want us to use high cost electricity. We have <laughs> our own energy, plenty of it. So we don't need to import, so we're at an advantage. And it's all domestic. Anything you import, that of course adds to the trade deficit, which is already bad enough as it is. So People are advocating, but not seeing the whole picture. They say we want electric vehicles, but they don't realize what the impact will be on the grid. They don't realize what the impact is that you can't do it with wind and solar, because you have to get to work. So you have to use gas, because that's the most efficient. You don't want to use coal and oil. You don't want to use nuclear. That leaves gas. You can use nuclear. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> you Just can, a point. You can, you can use nuclear, but you don't want to. Why? All right. So, Why? by the I way, by the way, uh, <laughs> worldwide, worldwide, you know, the U.S. is only 20% of the world these days. Worldwide, nuclear generation. The production of electricity from nuclear has increased for the last five years. Right? Other countries are using and generating more nuclear electricity France. than yeah. Europe, Japan, and the U.S. It's taking place elsewhere. So we may take this position, oh, we are, don't want nuclear, this and that, but that may not be a good position to take. <laughs> the nuclear plants today are just like our cars today. They're far more reliable, far more safe than they were 40 years ago. So <laughs> to, to, to not go in that direction, exactly. it's strictly a Japanese thing. A German thing, it was political, <laughs> Japanese, because of this the tsunami, but in Germany it was political, and in the U.S. it's because we have plentiful coal and, coal and gas. They're just not competitive. In the U.S., nuclear plants are not competitive with coal. The new plants are not. The old plants are, but the new plants are not. Because coal is, so, coal is so low cost, and, and gas is so low cost. And as a result, the nuclear plants are not being built in the U.S. because the electricity that they would produce would be more expensive than from coal and from gas. I, I hate to interrupt. I'm not doing that because you, it's five after, and oh. sometimes people have buses to take to Kendall and so okay. forth. And so I really, I, I, I don't think I've managed it well about your talk because you, you <laughs> real really... Really, uh, anyway, I think talk. I got my point across. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? You make, this is a lot of food for thought. And uh, I've been thinking about this quite a bit, of course. You know, when you write articles, you have to go to the internet a lot. You have to go to many sources to see what you can do with it. And uh, one thing leads to another. And so, uh, some of this uh, information I presented is at variance with what you have read, but then again, that I can't help, you know? <laughs>